So, dear respected uh, Siom, dear respected brother and sister, we listen to three sam the bell before uh, we have the Dharma talk. So dear respected uh, Siom, dear respected brother and sister, today is the 15th of August, year 2020, and we are in the Dutch retreat, retreat for Dutch-speaking friends as well as uh, other friends um, who speak a different language, <laughs> but who come to the Dutch retreat. <laughs> Today, uh, our bell master is Sita Chiungim. Sita Chiungim. She's a, a Dharma teacher in, uh, in Thai tradition. And she hopes to decorate the, all of these uh, uh, meditation hall and the stays together with Sita Trang Nguyen Yu, the one who, who works in the bookshop that you, perhaps you met her now. In, yes, Sita uh, Tang Wing Yu, yes. Tang Wing Yu. Tang is the moon, and Wing Yu is miraculous or wonderful. Uh, wing is a difficult word to translate. Wing has the meaning of uh, like sacred, uh, mysterious, um, something that is uh, out of ordinary. And you is the wonderful, uh, miraculously wonderful, is wing you. So the moon of uh, mystical wonder, you can translate like that. And Sita Chang Chiu Nghiêm, no, Sita Chang, Sita Chiu Nghiêm, Chiu is uh, shining, shining. And Nim is an ornament, an ornament with the shining mind, shining mind, clear mind. Mm-hmm. All of the names that Thay and the Sangha give to our brother and sister are beautiful names. <laughs> and that is how we practice uh, 
to cultivate the quality of happiness within us. So tomorrow, some of our friends will receive the five mindfulness training, and you will be given a new name, <laughs> a Dharma name. <laughs> My phone is sometimes helpful so that we don't break the microphone. <laughs> we stand up slowly so we are stuck back there. <laughs> and uh, our friends who uh, received the five My phone training t- tomorrow morning will uh, have a new Dharma name. Mm. It's very meaningful to. Uh, to, uh, to remember our name. It helps us to remember our aspiration on the path. And just the practice of mindfulness of our name. Mm. Mindfulness is the practice of uh, being there, remember, recollect. Uh, so mindfulness is recollection, recollection, Remembrance, mm. Mm. being present, all of these are quality of uh, being mindful, being present, uh, mindful, mm. so the practice of Recollection is a very important uh, practice for our happiness. We choose a quality of uh, goodness, and we are mindful of that quality for as long as possible. And that's called the, the practice of recollection or remembrance. In Buddhism, there's the practice called Nibbuk. That means Recollection of the Buddha. Nimbu is recollection of the Buddha. That means you remember or you bring to your mind all of the good quality of a Buddha. That means the Buddha is someone who has great understanding, who has great compassion, who has a deep knowledge about reality. He has perfect all of his action regarding the body, the mind, uh, the speech, all of the good quality that he had developed to, to, uh, to the highest degree, as much as possible. So let's say, if Sita Tang Nguyen Yu know that her name means the moon of mystical wonder, she allowed her, herself to remind herself of this wonderful quality of the moon. We look at the moonlight, very bright, and it's so wonderful on the sky, and it gives us a feeling of, of out of the ordinary, out of... Um, of the worldly things. We talk about the object of the desire the other day, and those objects of the desire can bring us a lot of suffering. Uh, for example, uh, wealth, uh, sex, uh, fame, authority, food, and um, inaction, sleeping, sluggishness, drowsiness. Not being clear, confusion. We 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 want to have confusion as much as possible. Sometimes we don't want to wake up. <laughs> we enjoy being confused, and sometimes there's confusion, and we add in more smoke to make it more confused. <laughs> So if we, uh, we recollect a wonderful quality, 
like the quality of the moon is very wonderful. You get in touch with the moonlight and you feel your whole spirit is being lifted up. You go into another dimension of space and time. In Buddhism we call it space outside space, time outside time. Mm. That is the domain beyond our thinking, beyond our notion, beyond our idea. It is the domain of direct experience. Mm. That's what it means, direct experience. When we have a direct experience, and we are beyond any notion and concept, it gives us, it gives rise to us the greatest happiness. Mm. So when someone who receives the five methods training or become a monastic, they receive a name. And we, from time to time, we recall our name, we recollect our name, and we feel the aspiration that we, that we had committed to uh, on the first day that we received the Five Methodist Training. Mm. And it gave us a lot of happiness, a lot of joy. Sometime, uh, sometime on our path of the practice, due to conditions and circumstances, we do not uh, continue on with our path. Mm. It's difficult to maintain our path for a long time. It's very difficult to remain in monks or in nuns for a long time. It's, it's difficult to be a teacher for a long time. <laughs> we lose our aspiration. And it's difficult to be a partner for a long time. Mm. We lose the inspiration for the other person. After we live with the other person for two years, three years, or five years, or ten years, the other person becomes ordinary. It's not extraordinary anymore. <laughs> that is uh, the tendency of our mind. Our mind have the tendency to turn everything into the old things. We cannot maintain this energy, the newness, the newness. Something that remains new forever, the newness. I don't know whether this, the, this word in English, I just make it up. <laughs> newness. There's this newness that everything you touch becomes new again. It's difficult. Our mind slowly, slowly becomes sluggish, become uh, um, disturbed, agitated, uh, and all the time looking out for trouble. And that's the reason why we cannot maintain our happiness. Our mind continues to run into this, uh, this uh, track. So the practice of uh, recollection, recollection is a very powerful, uh, powerful way to practice. For example, you sit, and you sink the energy down to your lower abdomen. And you feel your body and you allow your whole body to relax. And you maintain this, this mindfulness. You maintain this mindfulness on your body. The feeling of the sensation of being relaxed. And you continue to relax, continue to relax, continue to relax. And that is the practice of mindfulness, of relaxation of the body. Mm. Very simple. Mm. You are mindful of this state of relaxation within you, and you just continue to bring it to your mind. 
you feel this relaxation and you allow your body to relax. And after some time, your mind begins to go into that direction. Our mind is wonderful. With an untrained mind, uh, we can cause ourselves a lot of trouble and unhappiness. But with a trained mind, a mind that is well trained, we can learn to learn to um, learn to cultivate the positive energy within us, mm. and the energy of joy and happiness within us. We can cultivate that energy when we know how to use our mind. Mm. The Buddha said in the book called Dhammapada, The Path of the Dharma, some people translate it as the word of the Buddha, um, or The Path of the Dharma. The two verses in that book, the Buddha said that uh, we are what we think, or we are what we intended to. If we are thinking of a negative thought, only one single negative thought, then that negative thought will bring along all of the negative things into our life. Just like an ox carry, pulling the cart, the chariot pulling the chariot. Only a single negative thought, it will bring, it will be able to pull the whole, the whole truck of negativity <laughs> into our life. And it's, the first part is called parallel verse. So one is on that side and one is in this side, parallel. The parallel verse said that we are what we think. If we think of only one positive thought, one positive thinking, then all of the good things will follow us like the shadow follow the form. Like we walk in the sun and the sunshine and the form has a shadow. The shadow will follow us, follow the form all the time. So the practice of mindfulness, of uh, recollection of one positive quality, choose a positive quality, and remain with that positive quality, and then it begins to do its work. Maintain that as long as possible. And anything that is negative, Learn to bring it down as soon as you recognize it. Don't think about it. Don't focus your mind on the negative things. And if the negative thing has not come up, do not touch it. Do not touch that. Because uh, there's always negative things. And if there is not a positive thing, there's not a positive thing that come up yet, then try to think of a positive things and bring it up as soon as possible. And that is uh, the practice that we set uh, the the other day, the five particular mental factor. Mm. The, f- the first factor is uh, willingness or the desire. Mm. Mm. And the second is conviction. Conviction, belief. 
The third is mindfulness. The fourth is mental collectedness. And the fifth is the wisdom or knowledge. So, if we want to be happy, if we want to be happy, we want to be happy, then have give rise to this desire to be happy. Desire to be happy. And choose a positive mental positive mental quality and maintain that until it becomes a belief it becomes a conviction within us at first we do not feel that quality yet but we maintain the mindfulness on it. Keep it that in mind. For example, feeling well, I breathe in. Feeling light and joyful, I breathe out. At first, you do not feel light yet. Because it's <laughs> you don't feel light. You don't feel well in your body, but you maintain it. Feeling very well in my body, I breathe in. And you, you, you generate this feeling of wellness within you. It's called mind training. And then feeling light, I breathe out. And you sit there and you use those just like a mantra. And mantra is something that you repeat mentally, and feeling, you experience it. Learn to have a direct experience of that. Learn to have a direct experience of, of, that, uh, of that positive quality. And if you, you are lucky, <laughs> when the conditions are sufficient, when you are lucky, then sometimes you you enter into a trance. You enter into a trance. That means you enter into a kind of absorption. And feeling very well, I breathe in. Feeling light, I, I breathe out. Feeling well, feeling light. Feeling very well, feeling light. And you enter into a trance, and then suddenly you hear the bell. Half an hour have gone by, and you thought that you just make a few breaths only. Your mind have this capacity. Your mind have this capacity to focus, to focus and to turn something into a reality. And this quality, this quality of the mind, in the Buddhist tradition, we call it bhava. Bhava. Bhavana. Bhavana is, uh, is to cultivate. Mm. To cultivate. Bhavana. Cultivate. To cultivate like to cultivate the few. At first, the few does not have any rights. But you put on the, uh, the little plant, the little sprout, the rice uh, sprout. And then after that, slowly, slowly, it grow into the big rice plant, bhavana. 
So at first, the whole field does not have rice, um, rice plant, or the whole field does not have the sunflower. But then you put the, the sunflower seed into the earth, you put the water and the sunshine, slowly, slowly, one day, something comes, sprout. And you see the whole field of sunflower. And that's called bhavana, cultivation. And this five mental, particular mental factor is the five way, is the, the five quality of the mind, the five characteristics of the mind that help to bring something into the reality, bhavana. This five particular mental factor help cultivate a particular a particular quality in our life. We listen to one sound of the bell. <coughs> So this capacity of cultivating the mind is, uh, is called uh, meditation. Mm. Medita- meditation is the practice that helps to cultivate our mind, to cultivate the positive quality of our mind. And, and because it is a cultivation, you need to do it regularly as much as possible. Mm. For example, if you, you have uh, put in the, the seed, uh, the sunflower seed into the field, but uh, you don't water it, and there's a lot of sunshine, and, and it's very hot or something, you don't take care of it, and then perhaps those will not sprout up into a beautiful plant. But if you spend time to cultivate the field, you take good care of it, then uh, one day the sunflower will come. The same thing. We all have the capacity to blossom beautifully. That's what the Buddha discovered in his enlightenment. And the, the secret is our mind. The secret is our mind, and we need to train our mind, and we need to, to train our way of life in order for, for happiness to come. Good quality, a life that blossoming to come. And the Buddha teach us three way to cultivate a good life. The first is we need to look at our uh, behavior. Mm. Our behavior. Mm. 
Sometimes people call this the ethical conduct. Ethical conduct. Mm. Or our behavior. To cultivate our behavior or ethical conduct, the, we practice something called mindfulness training. Mm. Mindfulness training. We have, we heard about the mindfulness training the other night. And there are five uh, training, there are five training that uh, that our teacher Thay, um, he put down in accord with the spirit taught by the Buddha. In the past, the the mindfulness training for the lay friend is very simple. In the Buddha time, mm. the first one is do not kill. <laughs> very simple. Nowadays, when you read the first mindfulness training, it's very elaborated. The, but the idea is do not kill. The second is do not uh, steal. Do not take what is not given to us. Hmm. And on the positive side, we learn to practice generosity, to offer, to give. Hmm. And that is the second mindfulness training. The third mindfulness training is do not have uh, sexual misconduct. Sexual misconduct means that Nowadays, in the modern time, it's different. In the old day, unless you marry someone, you don't sleep with the, uh, that person. If you sleep with another person, then that is sexual misconduct. Because uh, you don't enter into the relationship seriously, mm, with full commitment. And our body is very, very sacred. And the moment we have a sexual activity with another person in a careless way, it can leave a wounded within us, deep wounded. Because that is a part of our deep activity as a human being. And if we don't take it seriously, then there will come a lot of wounded within us, a lot of damage within our body as well as in our mind. The fourth concerning our speech, mm -hmm. that we have to say truthful things and so on. And the fifth is our consumption, consumption that is alcohol. Do not consume alcohol or any intoxicant that that make our mind become disturbed. Hmm. Because we want to cultivate the mind, so any, any uh, material that make the mind confused or not clear, then that against our purpose. So it's very clear that we, we need to, to do that. So it is our behavior. And the second is our, the second is our mind, mental training. Mm. Mental training. We have to learn to recognize our mind, recognize our emotion, and take good care of it. As soon as there is any thought, negative thought coming up, any negative emotion coming up, we need to train our mind so that we are not carried away by this negative th thinking, negative thought and negative emotion. We learn to come back right away. R right away we recognize this tendency within us and transform it as soon as possible. Our, our mind has many layers in uh, 
some the Buddhist uh, there are many uh, model of Buddhist psychology, but there is one model that is very uh, useful is that the lower layer of our consciousness is called store consciousness. The store consciousness. Store consciousness store all of our experience. All all experience. Mm. All all experiences are are stored in our store consciousness. Anything that we do in the form of uh, thinking, in the form of speaking, in the form of acting, become a seed, become a potential, and it's deposit into our star consciousness. For example, if we just have a little bit of irritation, then right away, this experience of being irritated become a seed in our star consciousness. A little bit of, uh, of unkindness in our heart. It become right away a seed in our star consciousness. And once this become a seed, then there is the possibility that it will grow. <laughs> bigger and bigger as time go on. All the experience will come in and reinforce the seed. So when we were young, we were very fresh and uh, we had a lot of uh, positive energy. But the more we grow up, if we do not have a mental training, if we don't have a mental training and we don't know how our mind works, we allow the seed within us to grow. And if we allow the negative seed within us to grow, then sooner or later, that seed will affect our life, affect our behavior, affect how we think, how we perceive our perspective of the world. So don't neglect the smallest unskillful act or an unskillful speech or unskillful thinking. Don't neglect. If they will become a seed. And later, it will grow up. Yesterday, Sita being him talk about the four noble truths. The first noble truth is that there is a, there is a suffering. Mm. Suffering is uh, the word translated from uh, Bali, dukkha. dukkha. And dukkha here means unsatisfactory. Unsatisfactory. Mm. Unsatisfactory because there are negative seed in our in our mind. And this seed is not something static. It's always moving within us. Mm. Because we are a living organism. We are a dynamical system. So this seed don't stay down there stationary. It moves. It's always moving underneath. And it causes unsatisfactory. In the morning, when we practice uh, the moving meditation, 
we allow our body to move and we allow the energy within us to circulate. So we direct the energy of this negative C in a positive way. In the morning, we feel ache, we feel not alive, we feel not uh, energetic. And all of the seed within, the negative seed within, keep moving, keep moving. It wants to express itself. And then when you meet someone and the other person just do something, then it is only the final condition for the seed within you to manifest. Don't think that the anger comes from your beloved one. Yes, it comes from your beloved one, like 5%. <laughs> but 95% is your seed within you. If you are very peaceful, and your beloved one come with all of his irritation and angry, you are fine. But because within you there is only this seed, the movement of the negative seed, ready to jump out, <laughs> waiting to jump out. And you try to control it, try to control it. <laughs> but these negative seed wait for the chance to get out as soon as possible. Mm. So what did the Buddha discover? He discovered that in our mind there's all of these potential, negative potential, and he called it dukkha, unsatisfactory. That's what he discovered. And actually, the Four Noble Truth is not really the truth but it is a four reality that is being discovered by the enlightened one. It is not a truth is a right and wrong. It's not really that kind of truth. It's not like a logical statement that of right and wrong, the truth statement. It is true and the other thing is not, is not truth. It's not like that. The translation into the Four Noble Truth is an old translation that does not convey the meaning fully of what the Buddha tried to teach. Because of the language problem, language barrier, and now it's thick and it become a part of uh, all of the Buddhist texts called the Four Noble Truth. But in, in fact, after many research and investigation into the language and the context and so on, mm. we can say that it is the four reality that the Buddha discovered in his enlightenment. And what is that first reality? The first reality is that there is this sense of being unsatisfied deeply within us due to the, all of this negative potential coming from the old experience. And it's very important. When you wake up to this reality, you become noble. And if you don't, then you continue to be an ordinary person. Hmm. So the first reality that you need to wake up to is that there is this, this uh, negative potential within you, ready to manifest at any moment. If you wake up to this reality, it's only very helpful to your relationship. Because you keep practicing mindfulness, being aware of the movement of your mind. Your mind moves. Your mind is a, a torrent. Your mind is a stream, turbulent stream of water. Your mind is not 
is not uh, is not uh, stagnant. It is something that moving all the time. And underneath this this stream of your mind, there's all kind of potential. All of this potential. And all of this potential begin to accumulate and that is the second reality that the, the Buddha discovered. Hmm. There is suffering and there is the accumulation. There is the accumulation or growth of unsatisfactory. That is what the Buddha discovered, the second reality. That these potential, if you don't do anything about it, it will grow. It begins to accumulate, it begins to gather its strength, and it begins to affect your life. So suffering is a reality that is in the process of coming to be. Let's say you, you drink alcohol, for example. You drink alcohol to forget your sadness, to forget your depression, for example. You think that the alcohol will, will make you forget, but the sadness, the depression is still there within you. You drink alcohol, you forget it, but this potential continues to accumulate. There are some other events in your life that make you feel more sad, that make you feel more depressed, and you don't do anything, you continue to drink alcohol. And then so these potential begin to grow within you. And slowly, slowly, it destroys you. Yesterday I told you about my experience as a little child. When I was four or five years old, I already had this uh, feeling of being de- depressed because I don't see the way out. I don't see the future. I don't see the point of growing up. And it is a seed within me. And I don't know. I don't know and I keep doing things to, to, to cover it up. To escape it. And then slowly, slowly, there comes the point that it grows too big. And it paralyzes me. It makes me paralyzed. Really, there are days that I feel paralyzed. I don't want to do anything. Those potential have that capacity. And that is the second reality that the noble one enlightened to. Is that our suffering is in the process of accumulating. If we don't do anything about it. So our mental training is, uh, is the capacity to observe our mind. Mental training. Learn to observe our mind. Learn to observe all of these potential. And all of these potential does not happen only in this life. But all of these old experience according to Buddhism have come from infinite life. <laughs> infinite life cycle. Wow. All of the potential of your parents, all of the suffering of your parents have entered into you, believe it or not. And all of these potential you will pass on to your children and your great-grandchildren. You continue to manifest in them in the form of suffering or in the form of joy and happiness, depending on how you live. 
the more suffering you have, the more suffering you will pass on to your children. The more joy and happiness you have, the more joy and happiness you will pass on to your children and your grandchildren. And Thay said that the, the best heritage that you can offer your children is your joy and your happiness. They wrote it in Vietnamese. I don't know whether in English how he translated it. But I translated from Vietnamese is that the best heritage that you can pass on to your children and your future generation is the joy and happiness of the parents. So this, the problem is serious. There is an accumulation or growth of unsatisfactory. And it is a process that had been going on for infinite lifetime. We as a homo sapiens species, we have inherited all of these uh, violence, all of these uh, heritage of, uh, of fighting for existence with other hominid, with other animals for a long time. Nowadays on earth, we have our species have more than seven billion members or so. <laughs> Soon it will become 8 billion soon. <laughs> no speci- other species on earth except coronavirus. <laughs> and that has as much population as human species. So there are a lot of violence that we have inherited. That is said doesn't mean that we condemn our ancestor. No. Our ancestor they have tried their best to survive. They have tried their best to to maintain our species. They have done it in a violent way. Now we we have the, the heritage when we have the fortune to take good care of ourselves. And we need to 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 learn to share our life with other species on earth, learn to live together, to reduce the amount of suffering and violence in all of the animal kingdom as well as the plant kingdom. I, I said that uh, the Buddha being a new species, instead of a homo sabian, the Buddha create a new species, and that is uh, Homo Liberatus. <laughs> also, please check the Latin word. <laughs> Don't trust my Latin. <laughs> Homo Liberatus. Hmm. And so, learn to go back and learn to, to take good care of the suffering within you as much as possible. I know that it's not easy. It took me a long time to transform my depression. And even now, sometimes when there are difficulty in the community or difficulty in my family or difficulty in the world, this feeling of being depressed manifests. And I need to take good care of it. When you can remove it completely, then that's great. But when you are not able to, to completely resolve it yet, you have to work, you continue on the path. You continue on the path and don't give up. Don't give up. Keep doing it. And you know that sometimes it's very difficult. And depend on different person. Each of us have things that we need to resolve. Some of us, we have a lot of difficulty with the energy of anger. Some of us, we have a lot of difficulty with the energy of depression. Some of us, 
we have a lot of difficulty with energy of jealousy. Some of us, we have a lot of difficulty with being lonely. Some of us have a lot of difficulty with irresponsible sexual behavior. We are not responsible with our sexual activity. Some of us have difficulty with the way we speak. We say unskillful word, unkind word, untruth. We making up the story, exaggeration. We create a story and we make the situation become more and more confused. So each one of us have our own difficulty. So being enlightened means mean awaken up to this potential within us. And knowing that the potential can grow and we do something to transform it. And the Buddha declared, that's why we need the Buddha. The Buddha declared the third reality that is, there is the ending of the unsatisfactory. It's a good news. <laughs> there is the ending or the calming down. Mm. The coming down. Mm. Mm. The coming down, the appeasement. Mm. Appeasement mm. of unsatisfactory. Unsatisfactory. For example, you feel a sense of uh, being irritated. You feel a sense of being irritated. Then, what do you do? You go back to your in breath and your out breath. You feel your body. You relax your body. And you feel the irritation within you and you embrace the irritation with all of your love. And you stay with your irritation. You don't let go. You don't deny it. You don't escape. You don't deny your irritation. You don't escape. You are there fully for your irritation. You can put your hand on your belly. You can put your hand to embrace yourself like this. And you, it's very good. I like to do this very much. I put my hand around me. And my arm, my hand touch my body and I feel the warmth of my hand and I feel right away being embraced. So I sit there and embrace my irritation with all of my love and my care. Stay with it. Don't let go. Stay with it, feeling so much love with it. And then after some time, there is the coming down. There is the appeasement of the unsatisfactory. That's what it means. It's not difficult to do. The third reality is not something that, that is so difficult to do. With a very few simple practice, simple practice, you can do it. You might just sit there, put your arm around you, or you lie down and you embrace, and you come back, you feel so much love for you. Your depression, your anger, any of these negative emotion, feeling, you embrace it, and you see that these are your son and your daughter. <laughs> your anger is your son. <laughs> your depression is your daughter. Really? They are your son and they are your daughter. And actually, they are signal. Because we are a dynamical system. All of these emotions has building within us so that we can adjudge our behavior, adjudge how we live, so that we can adapt to the situation. 
in the past, anger manifests itself because we try to scare up some animal. We try to scare someone and we, we raise our, we open our mouth and we put our uh, <laughs> teeth, long teeth. What do you call that long teeth? Yeah, you know what I mean. These, yeah, fang, the teak, the long teak, and you try to scare the other. But now, why do you do that with your partner? Why do you need to scare your partner <laughs> with your anger? <laughs> we we inherited uh, from our ancestor, from our Homo sapiens species, but that that behavior is old behavior. We don't need to, we don't need to, uh, to, to use that behavior in our life. Hmm? So we embrace it. And we tell ourselves, no, my partner is not so dangerous like the tiger or some other that I need to scare. <laughs> my partner is very sweet. <laughs> <laughs> you embrace and there is the possibility of coming down let me see what time is it now so that I don't get, run out of time ok still a few more minutes <laughs> there is a coming down the appeasement of unsatisfactory and this coming down First of all, is the coming down of the energy. For example, your anger, you, you have the anger, and when you embrace it, it comes down. And then, and then if you are lucky, when you embrace it with energy of your love, then suddenly there is a transformation in your anger, in your depression, in your jealousy, in irritation. And suddenly, sometimes tears come out to your eyes. Somehow, sometimes you feel vibration in your whole body. There is a deep transformation of energy within you when you return to the signal and embracing the signal. You see that there is a deep transformation at the energy level. But then, slowly, slowly, when you practice longer and longer, there is a particular coming down that is wonderful and is only come with the full enlightened one. That is the melting away of a subjective consciousness. The melting away of the feeling of an I up and me. We, as human beings, we have been designed by evolution so that slowly, slowly, we have a coherent experience, a co coherent subjective experience. Mm. For example, right now, let's say the light mm. coming in, mm. coming into me from these two light. There's a stream of a photon continue to to come to me in the form of energy. Mm. But then, if if evolution did not mask my way of looking at it, and I see separate photon coming at me as a stream of these uh, wave of photon coming at me, and I have the capacity to detect these photon and to see it stream in a and permanent stream, then it will be, become very disturbing for me to operate as a human being. As a human being, I have to reduce the precision of my sensation down 
so that it becomes something I can evaluate and I can live with. For example, when I look at uh, a friend in front of me, then this friend is a wonderful reality with all of her ancestors, with all of her past, with all of her experience. But when it comes to me, right away, my brain reduces it into a form, a shape, a color, a notion, an idea. We reduce the information to minimum. And this process of reducing the information to the minimum creates this illusion of a subjective experience, a something that is fixed, something that is me. And because of this me, the Buddha called it the self, the experience of an I and me, this experience begins to react to its environment to the thing that is not me, that is not I. So when you calm down, when you are able to calm down, and you are able to go beyond your emotion, and your energy begins to circulate, then what happens is that this feeling of having a subjective consciousness that means a me and I slowly being melted away. It doesn't mean that we will see the stream of photon coming up. No, it's not like that. But we learn to experience and to feel the experience the way it is, and there's only experience. And not there is a subjective consciousness behind this experience. But we only experience as a stream of experience. And there is a great freedom. The Buddha called this experience Nirvana. What is Nirvana? Nirvana is the experience in which you only experience. <laughs> you experience and there's only experience. And there's the ending of the, 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 archi- the, the, arching, the arching of a subjective consciousness behind your experience. It doesn't mean that you completely dissolve into your experience. In some of the tradition, people believe that there is this non-duality in which we melt into, there's a melting between the subject and the object. But for me, I think it's quite simple. We just fully experience the event, and there is no feeling of an I experience that. And we are free. For example, let's say when you come back to your home. And if you practice very well and you embrace your emotion, your reaction very well, and let's say your partner says something and you listen deeply, completely, there's no reaction. And this moment, you experience something called non-self. You experience There's no me who's there being attacked by my my partner. (laughs) You are free. And that's what the Buddha called Nirvana. Nirvana is the capacity to experience the event and be there completely and not being a victim of, of this sense of having a me behind who experiences it. It's quite simple to do with enough training and you get used to it. Hmm. Let's say when someone says something, you go back to your in-breath, your out-breath, you bring the energy down to your abdomen. You are fully there. And when you are ready, you said, 
my dear partner, please go ahead. I'm ready. <laughs> you are ready. You bring the energy down. The energy is not up here. And she come and she says something is best to as if the wind go to a tree very calm and peaceful. There's no storm. You are in your trunk. You are in the root. It's quite simple to do. The only time you have difficulty is when you are caught in surprise. When you are not ready and your partner comes behind you and says something, that, that begins to attack your block of irritation <laughs> or your block of anger. That is the problem. But the moment you sit down, you enjoy your in-breath, your out-breath, you feel your low abdomen, and gently you tell your partner, please tell me what is in your heart. You can receive it completely. And you can experience non-self. Nirvana is an experience that we can experience with enough training and skillfulness. It's not something difficult. Nirvana is the way we experience our life fully in which the sense of me the sense of I in that experience is not there. We are fully without experience. And that is the greatest happiness. That is the greatest happiness because we can experience our life fully. So on the first night, I said there is a happiness and joy that is born of uh, mindfulness. Then there is a happiness and joy born from a mental collectedness. And there is a joy and happiness that come from inside. Inside. And then once you have trained yourself enough, then joy and happiness come because you feel being liberated. The joy and happiness come from liberation. 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 Mm. Once you are able to embrace your anger, you you are free for your, from your anger, there is a sense of happiness and joy because you are free from your anger. And that is joy and happiness coming from liberation. And the last aspect is the joy and happiness come from knowledge, the knowledge that you being liberated. <laughs> the knowledge of being liberated. Mm. Liberated. For example, let's say when um, when your um, your partner come and say something to you, let's say you 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 feel a sense of being irritated. So you practice mindfulness of this irritation. After you practice for some time, this energy of mindfulness turns itself into mental collectedness. You are there. Your irritation does not spread out and does not grow like a big fire in the forest, but it's contained, and that is mental collectedness. And then you embrace it, you embrace it, and you get into the joy and happiness, the insight of non-self, the insight of, uh, of uh, interbeing, the insight of connectedness. For example, you feel this irritation and you look back, this irritation that you have learned when you were young, this feeling of being depressed, this your old experience when you were a teenager, for example. And then you see the deep connectedness because you behave that way. So that's why your partner behaved that way. Mm. 
It's not her alone, but you are responsible in that experience. And then there's come inside. You understand your block of anger. And then after this deep understanding, you are able to liberate from the notion of an I. You get in touch with the feeling of nirvana. And then there comes the sense of liberation. You feel this sense of liberation. And then you understand deeply and you have the knowledge of being liberated from this anger. That is the whole process. And that's how joy and happiness is defined in Buddhism. Joy and happiness is a process of cultivation, beginning with mindfulness, and it comes to the end at knowledge of being liberated. Because the time is short, so I go a bit, uh, I fast forward a little bit. <laughs> so we can do, we can do some walking meditation. <laughs> Enjoy your liberation and your joy and happiness. Yes, please. <laughs> At the fourth truth is the, is the reality that the noble one discover that there is a path to ending the unsatisfactory. And the path depends on how you talk about the path. It could be the noble A4 path that Sister Bingham talked about yesterday. Today, I, I give you another path. And that is this path here. That is the four reality. Okay? So yesterday, so the four is that there is, the, there is a path to end the unsatisf- unsatisf- unsatisfactory. There is the path. And, and this is, the number four is is the whole Buddhism because there are so many practices. So there is the practice of the Theravada tradition, there is the practice of the Tibetan tradition, of the Zen tradition, of the Chinese tradition, of the Vietnamese tradition. 2,500 years. So the number four is not limited to the Noble Eightfold Path. The Noble Eightfold Path is in that uh, uh, sutra, the first sutra that the Buddha taught. Mm. The Noble Eightfold Path is the first path the Buddha t- drew up for he is a practitioner uh, during the first Dharma talk he gave after his enlightenment about two months. After his enlightenment, he spent about seven weeks underneath the Bodhi tree to enjoy and contemplate about his teaching. And then, and then after that, he walked from uh, the, uh, the village called Uruvela near the kingdom, uh, uh, in the kingdom Magadha. And he walked to his Isipatana, the deer park. In, uh, um, nowadays, it's uh, Banares. And the distance is about I would say 700 kilometers to 1,000 kilometers, something like that. And he walked by feet. So it took him a long time from that village to Banaras. So it could be two months after the Buddha enlightened, he gave the first Dhamma talk. And in that first Dhamma talk, he talked about the fourth reality, and that's the noble A4 path. But for 2,500 years, Buddhism had developed, and through 45 years of teaching, the Buddha developed all kinds of path. So, once we understand, once we understand, then we can design our own path. That's the key. The path is not uh, fixed. The path depends on the individual. Each individual needs a different path. For example, if you have problem with your sexual activity, you are not responsible with your activity, then you need to find your path. 
to learn to transform that. And let's say if you have problem with killing, then you need to find out your own path to cultivate compassion, to cultivate uh, loving kindness, to protect living being. And if you, let's say, if you say untruthful thing all the time, then you need a different path. You need to practice loving speech. You need to, um, to repeat uh, the sutra, chanting the sutra, reading the sutra, repeating the word of the enlightened one, so that it becomes your habit. Mm. So you have a different training. So understanding the different reality, and then you find your own path that is appropriate for you as a practitioner. What is the path that is applicable to me, that is most appropriate to me? Then, with this understanding, if you see some other brother and sister practice in a different way, you are completely open to their practice because you know they need it. You don't need it, but they need it. So let them do that. Okay? And there's no conflict. Yes, please. Uh, the third one, uh, yeah, that, that <laughs> the third one is the 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 the, in, the, the one that I talk about non-self, insight into non-self, mm. insight to non-self, yeah, mm. insight to non-self, mm. Mm. and that is what. I said already, but I didn't write it down. When you, you are there with your experience, fully with your experience. Good. <laughs> All right. So let's enjoy a few minutes of sitting, uh, following up breathing, and then we enjoy a little walking meditation. <laughs> 